Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, welcome to Ask the Developer Live, a series of conversations with thought leaders in the mobile apps industry, giving you quick and actionable insights to help you take your apps business to the next level. So I'm your host, Michael Fortune. I work as the Director of Field Marketing and Partnerships here at App11. If you're wondering what it is that App11 does, we provide a suite of software solutions that help fuel the growth for many of the world's top apps and mobile games. So our solutions are helping developers with everything from monetization to user acquisition to analytics and creative development. So moving into our conversation for today, uh, with how complex and sophisticated mobile UA has become, advertisers really need to turn to new methodologies and technologies to be able to stay ahead of the curve. So we're going to be exploring that today through the lens of automation and how this can drive more value for your business. So we've got two great guests who, who do a fantastic job of this and are always on the forefront of, of what's going on in, in UA. So uh, a little bit about how today's structure is going to go. We're going to start with some introductions of our guests and in, in just a moment, we'll move into the conversation and then for the last 10 to 15 minutes, we'll save some room for live Q&A. Uh, you can chat any questions into the Zoom window. We'll get to just as many as we can and uh, there'll be a bit of a surprise. So make sure you stick around to figure out exactly what that is. Uh, so without further ado, we'd love to welcome our uh, guest to the digital stage. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Pierre who been at Green Panda for the last three years uh, as a senior UA manager where he oversees the acquisition for hit titles, Idle Human and Nine Months. Welcome Pierre. Hello Michael, thanks for the introduction. I'd also like to introduce Cyril Kael, who's the Director of Business Development here at App11, where he's been for the last four years, helping businesses all across Europe to be able to grow uh, with user acquisition and monetization. And prior to App11, Cyril worked at a, um, as a UA manager at Gameloft. Uh, welcome, Cyril. Hey, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Michael. So fantastic to have both you gentlemen here. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. I think we're gonna have a lot of insights for you in the audience uh, who are uh, UA managers or are working in app businesses and would like to grow. So without further ado, we'd love to turn it over to you, Cyril, uh, to take it away. Thank you, thank you. Hey Pierre, uh, super excited to be chatting growth with you. So Thanks, maybe for, for the ones who, who don't really know yet, maybe for the rare ones, let's say that, don't, that may not know uh, Green Panda Games, can you maybe introduce yourself and, and explain a little bit what you do and where you're from and, uh, and uh, what, why are we chatting today? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So to keep brief introduction about Green Panda. So it was founded in 2013. We are around 120 people and we are two main studios that are in Paris, in France and in Ukraine, in Kiev, in Kharkiv. So we have other people that are remote, obviously right now around the world. But uh, yeah, initially our activity was about classic games such as Sudoku or Suretzer. And now since a couple of years now, we are specialized in hyper casual and casual either games. So as a quick reminder about the either games, so it could be named in incremental or clicker games and it's game based on about revenue management in order to increase your activity in the game. So on my side, personally, I, I love our games because it's always super funny to play. You have tons of progression super quickly, a lot of rewards. So at each session, it's always a pleasure to yeah, unlock new stuff and go to the next level. Nice, nice. So you mentioned you have 120 people. Um, like, How many people would there be in the marketing team, so to say? And maybe you can detail also how you structured the team between you and monetization, for example. Yeah, of course. So right now on the US side, we, we are four people and as well, we have a monetization team, four people as well. So on our side, we decide to split the activity in two different parts. I know that many companies have one user acquisition and monetization manager. On our side, we decide to split the activities in order to be as accurate as, as granular as possible. I, I think that this configuration is definitely great. We, are, we see really promising and cool results over the years. And regarding our activity, so we split the game between each UA and monetization manager. And after that, uh, we have kind of a duo. So on US side, you have your alter ego on monetization. And uh, yeah, I think it's the best setup for us in order to complement as good as possible. Nice. So you, you I mean, Green Panda mostly does, as you said, um, Either hyper casual or hyper casual, either. Um, maybe there's some 
marketability uh, testing process that's special to those games and so on. So maybe you can detail that a little bit. Yeah, of course. So regarding the marketability testing that we are currently doing, so initially we do a first test in order to measure classic APIs such as the CTR, the CVR, the CPI, the IPM, all the classic stuff that you are currently checking. And after that, we are looking for a second round of tests with more ad networks. So initially we just test on the first one. And after that, we try to do on several one in order to be sure that on every networks that have potential right now for us, we will be sure to have some traffic and good learning at least at the beginning. So yeah, I, I think it's really important as we are not that fast as hyper casual game like arcade or e ultra casual that are super fast to develop. I think on, on our side, on our either games, we need to be a bit more sure and confident about the quality of our prototypes. So we really take the time in order to be sure that the prototype will be great in order to work on it and develop it uh, in the incubation phase. Okay. And um, what, what's the revenue split, let's say, uh, in your games between in-app advertising and maybe in-app purchases or maybe subscription? Yeah. Trend? And uh, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, mainly on our side, I, I think it's more about 80-20. So 80% of in-app advertising and 20% could be split on direct IAP or in subscription. It really depends on the game. But yeah, most of the time we are around 80-20. Okay. And um, how would you define the goals when you start doing UA and so on? So you want to acquire new users. You are out of a testing process as well. Uh, what kind of optimizations you run and what KPIs you're looking at usually? Yeah, so as we mentioned before, we are looking for, for the CPIs, the CVR, et cetera, that all the KPIs that are available on, on the UA campaign on the ad network side. And after that, you need to determine so the LTV and the outdoor that you will have on your game. So basically, I think the most important stuff at the beginning is to see your, your LTV at D0, D1, and after that, see the evolution over the time in order to determine your LTV max, let's say in the time, could be could be reached at D7, could be reached at D30, D90, et cetera. So really important to see the progression of your LTV over the time. And I think the second point that you need to take into consideration in order to define the right goal for your campaign, it's really to see the virality that uh, your ad campaign could provoke on the organic users that you could have. So it could be because you reach the top. It could be because of good features as well. So you really need to take in consideration the virality of your game in order to define the right campaign and after that maximize your revenue. Okay, makes sense. And uh, if we talk about like Applovin specifically, uh, what kind of tools do you use the most uh, among all those that are available? Yeah, so... Uh, I think we are truly lucky to 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 work with uh, such nice guy as you and uh, and David as well. We have super good uh, code manager in order to to use. I I think on the right way the, the different tools. Uh, so initially we were doing some CPI campaign as uh, many of us. It's a, the classic one in order to have some good learning at the beginning. And now since several months now we are using the app discovery or RAS tool. Uh, up to you in in function of the name. And uh, yeah, I, I think these two uh, have some great competencies, especially on the updates on source level bidding that I think it's a huge topic that we will uh, cover later. But uh, to, to explain really quickly, thanks to this optimization, you have the ability to do some modification on the source level. So to give a quick recap to everyone, you can do optimization at, at the level of your campaign, at the level of your ad sets, of your ads, on your country as well. But the best granularity could be at the at the source directly. So we have thousands of different sources in each campaign, and you will have the ability to do those kind of modification on the sources. So it will be super granular and super, yeah, the best optimization as possible. Okay. So this is mostly what you run uh, across all networks, I guess, as well. Yeah, definitely. Each time, if we have the opportunity to have some Rust campaign. Right now we are doing it, and yeah, it definitely super super nice results. Okay, just yeah, as you said for for the, the audience, um, the RAS campaigns is different because we do audience targeting rather than source level bidding, and uh, and that allows basically to trigger more growth 
for the partners and being more accurate when it comes to setting your profitability goals and everything. So in your case, you, you, you were historically using CPI campaigns. And now because you, um, if you use Max as a mediation, uh, our system is able to uh, attribute the revenue at the user level and therefore also run UA um, at the audience level, like we say. And, uh, and that definitely triggers more growth and, and allows you to, to remain within your, your KPIs and your goals. Definitely. Sometimes you have huge frustration to say, okay, I need to set up my CPI limits. Let's say it will be 50 cents. And unfortunately, you will never reach the users that have 55 cents and that, that will have maybe three times better LTV. But unfortunately, you will never reach them. So on the other side, if we contrast with some RAS campaign, you will have the opportunity to, to put the RAS goal. And thanks to this goal, you will have the ability to have no threshold about the CPI, but just threshold about the percentage of gold that you will set up. So basically you can reach users at 20 cents and users at one dollar in this time. And you will have the possibility to just trigger the right users for your campaign and for your game. So it's definitely better incorporation of the CPI limit that you will set up on the, on the first time. Yeah, I think that that's pretty important. And like talking about the pain points, maybe running uh, the, the process you described before for CPI, like bidding at the source level and so on. Uh, what are the limits, um, the over limits, let's say, of the CPI campaigns and why you, you think like moving to ROAS basically automates most of your acquisition and doing does it smartly? Yeah, so uh, I think we, we have two points. So the first one is about the tool that we are currently using, about the, the quality of the optimization that we are currently doing thanks to the automation. And, and the second point is really about the limit of the CPI and, and the, the impossibility to reach the right users in, in your campaign. And I think most of the time you, you will reach some really bad users because you have these CPI limits. And most of the time, if your limit is really low, you will have low quality users. On the other side, if you have the ability to increase your CPI, you will have more quality users. You still have some bad, obviously, but most of the time your quality evolves thanks to your CPI augmentation. So if you are able to set up a good RAS goal, I think you will have only super good users and super good quality. And thanks to that, you will be able to scale over the time and over your lifetime campaign. Okay. So yeah, definitely, I think the limit is that you will have not the ability to reach uh, the true potential of your campaign. Okay, so on that, do you use like different uh, ROAS goals, like day zero ROAS, because uh, in this case, this is how the optimization is being made. So 24 hours uh, after the install. Um, do you use different goals maybe for like across your different games or maybe uh, across different geos and did it trigger new opportunities maybe because some in some cases you may not have been able to buy in tier two tier three geos before in cpi or maybe it required too, too much work to really does it the, the right way yeah i i think it's super important to take in consideration that you don't have any one ras goal for all your campaign each campaign will be unique each network will be unique each country will be unique. So it's it's really important to take in consideration that you will need to do this level of granularity as well regarding your RAS goal. So basically, as an example, with Artlevin, we set up a RAS goal at D0. So automatically, my RAS goal at D0 will never be the same on the US and on the Germany or in France or in China because the evolution of my ATV over the time will be not the same in those different countries. As well, if you change potentially your your products based on the on the country, if you do the translate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you will have maybe a boost in uh, in our users. So you need to take all those stuff in consideration. For example, for example, we are talking about T two, T three. If we, uh, as always, each one have a, his classification of T two and T three, but uh, on our side, basically, if we are looking some good good country that have true potential like Russia, like Brazil, like could be India as well, China, all those game have, uh, all those countries, sorry, have amazing uh, possibility in terms of uh, volume, in terms of quality as well, if you have the ability to target them properly. And uh, yeah, I think you need to do some work on, on, obviously on your product in order to do the translation of, of the game, of the store page, of your creative as well, and to check the market 
in order to maybe find the right spot. It's definitely not the same creative in China and United States. So it so it's really important to take all those points in consideration and say, okay, each market will be unique and each campaign as well on each different network. So you, you need to be yeah really serious about your campaign management, even is, if it's look magic with the Rora's goal in cooperation of, of the CPI, you still need to do a lot of work in order to have the best granularity and setup. Okay, so now you just talked about creative, so I think that's a good segue for, for, for my next question. Um, we, we all know that it's, it's pretty core to, to the success of a campaign and, um, and maybe you can describe a little bit your, um, how your team is structured to produce those creatives and how you test those creatives effectively. Yeah, of course. So we are truly really lucky. Initially, when I joined GPG uh, two, three years ago now, I, I was doing the, the creative myself. So it, <laughs> step by step, we, we learn a lot thanks to that. But unfortunately, I don't have the talent and the competencies in order to do the creative that we are currently doing right now. So yeah, we have a really, really good team of five people uh, that are working super closely with us in order to do the, all the different videos and assets that we are currently using. On the other side, we have another team of playable guys that are doing amazing jobs. So we have two teams, two different teams, one for the videos and one for the playables. And basically what we are currently doing is that everyone is free to propose any ID. And I think all ideas are good and the data will determine if your, if your ID is great or not at the end. So it's really important to, to give the, the chance to everyone to propose an ID, develop it, try it in order to, to iterate measure. And uh, yep, I think it's really working like that. We are super free about the, the optimization, about the creation of new content and regarding the test. So we always start with let's say the best creative that uh, everyone want to do at the beginning. And after that, we try to iterate step by step with all the different best practices and cases that we have on the other games in order to say, okay, we know that this type of um, scenario can work on all the different titles that we have. Let's try to iterate on it on the new one, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, yes, yeah, the most beautiful part is when, um, when the creative guy propose you some stuff that are pretty crazy or really abuse or quad at the beginning and you see amazing results. So yeah, never be shy to test some creative and only the results will say if it's good or not. Okay, and do you feed the data back to the creative team as well? Because you, you yeah. are at the front line, right? You're the, ones, uh, you're the one using the, uh, the creatives in, in your campaign. So yeah, is there like some kind of process in place so you can communicate about the, the results? Yeah, definitely. So we, we have two, two phases, let's say the first one is on the, on the prototyping phase. So the, the video team is working with us in order to, to establish all the, the creative for the prototype. And we send to them all the best creatives, the best scenarios that they do in order to do the optimization over the time and say, okay, guys, this one was really great. We need to keep in mind that it's definitely working on this type of segment of this type of scenarios. And after that, it's super helpful for them in order to say, okay, Remember this time it was working super well. Let's try to iterate on the same way. And on the second point on the published game. So as well, we, we have some tickets with them and we always try to say, okay, guys, the, the last iteration that we do was super great. So keep in mind that if you have any news ID, try to iterate on the previous that you just make because it was amazing. And if we succeed to do an iteration on this one it could be even better. So yeah, it's super important for, for us to give some feedback to the creative team in order to yeah, don't have um, a bl blind people, but uh, really, and obviously those people are really curious and want to have some feedbacks. And I think it's really important to give feedbacks to you, to your creative team. Okay. And uh, you, you, you guys build, let's say games that have quite some content because they're by definite, like by definition, idle games have a pretty big content. Do you leverage that um, during, I don't know, some special events, for example, or some time in the year, like with, seasonal events where it can be um, holiday season at the end of the year and so on. So do, do you adapt your creatives for that period during those periods? And do you also uh, implement new content tied to those events within the games directly? Yeah, de definitely. It's, it's quite new for us and we try to do it on several games with uh, less or, or best success, let's say. 
But uh, yeah, definitely some for, for Christmas, it's obviously for Halloween, it's definitely some period that we try to iterate on the creative, on the product as well. So I think that it's, it's really important as well to say with your product team, okay, guys, we want to go ahead uh, in two months on Halloween, for example, uh, let's try to work on some content in order to be ready two or three weeks before in order to launch our, your UA campaign in order to see if it's successful or not. Uh, we have one great example of um, Adel Human. You, you, we made some amazing room creatives with uh, Halloween period. And it was super, super great uh, result. Thanks to, to our partners, our the product team, the external partner that is fun said that doing an amazing job as well. So yeah, definitely it could be those kind of period where you can iterate pretty smartly on, on your creative and on your product as well in order to do a super great job. And did, did you already have a case, for example, where you, you run a creative, you saw that it was working pretty well, and therefore you implemented that content, that new content, let's say, in the game? Yeah, it is a life goal, I think, of uh, all the UA manager to, to say, okay, guys, you see my, my creative is the best of the world, and it's just a small tweaks in the game. So uh, it's, it was already the case. We, we already made this kind of optimization inside the game. So sometimes it's, it's funny to say, okay, we have amazing results in UA. We implement it in the game, and it's not working. So too bad, but... Uh, at least in UA it's working, so it's a great point. And sometimes we see, yes, some shy results or some significant results, but as, as we say before, I think if you're not testing those type of stuff, I think you are losing some opportunities and uh, just say, okay, U UA could be a lab in order to see all different features that we could add in the game. And keep in mind that if we have good results, maybe take a shot in order to to try it at least in, in an A-B test in order to see if it could be successful or not. So yeah, definitely we try to do those kind of A-B tests on our side as well. Okay, interesting. And um, so now, you, like with RISE campaigns and so on, RISE optimization, you can seem to autom automate as, as much as possible, right? So if we hit pause on the US side for now and uh, focus a little bit on the monetization side this time. So. Um, I remember you guys were pretty early adopters of in-app bidding, for example. Um, maybe you can share, I know you work on, in, on the UA team, of course, but uh, you, you're pretty close to the monetization team as well. But maybe you can share also some results um, you've seen after implementing in-app bidding and uh, how it helped you also automate even more and, and increase at, at the end of the day the, the update of your games and, and therefore have an impact on your growth strategy. Yeah, I think as we say before, you win obviously sometime with this type of tools. And I think it's pretty important to keep in mind that this this time that is saved of this yet yeah, difficult and time consuming operation, you, you will win it in order to do some other optimization, some other creative ideas, etc. And it's always super important to have those time in order to optimize all the different parts of your games and your company. And regarding the the uplift, uh, so I, I checked uh, with the monetization team uh, in order to be pretty sure. And I and yeah, we are around 10, 15% of uh, uplift on our app though, thanks to the in-app bidding A-B test. So it's definitely, when, when you win some money and some time, I think it's the best situation you can have. So yeah, definitely happy to, to pass on the in-app bidding. Nice. Um, no more on the on Green Panda games as like a business. Um, your development process changed a little bit from being mostly, um, let's say, publishing now to more in-house produced content and games. Um, did that change anything in the in the way you test and run user acquisition? Yeah. So we first of all we, we still stay a publisher and we still work with a lot of external developers and external studios and we still have good relationship with uh, with everyone else before this uh, type of twist. Uh, with a bit of development in internal internally, but uh, yeah, uh, just one. I just want to say before that thanks to everyone. I think to all the different studios and all the guys in GPG, we succeed over the time to yeah increase the level of the prototype of the of the game. And I truly see the evolution over the last three years in order to see that we move to really simple either games to really complex one now, and we succeed to reach the, the yeah the casual parts 
with really more complex mechanics and stuff. And I think we really succeed thanks to all the external developer and we are truly happy to, to still working with them on really ambitious projects on hyper casual and casual as well. And I think the only twist that we do is that now if we have really particular thematics that we want to develop, we will do it internally with a small in-house team. And I think the, the, the point that we can have, it's a bit more flexibility regarding, especially the prototyping phase. You can do super quick feedback, super small adjustments regarding the thematics. And I think it's, it's really a good point. But on the other side, it, we are truly happy to work with uh, external developers. And on my side, it's always funny to, to, to chat in order to have the, the best iteration with external developers on, on US side, you know, just to say thousands of ideas, say, okay, guys, uh, if you have time, maybe you can do it for us. Uh, it would be perfect to, to try this. <laughs> nice. Uh, maybe on that, actually, can you, can you share some tips with, uh, with the auditors on how to pick the best, let's say, user acquisition solutions and, and what you think is the most right for developers overall? Yeah. So, oh, honestly, uh, I think it's super difficult to do some, some UA when you are an alone developer or if you are a small studio, because you need to have the competencies, so all the different learnings, the money in order to do the, all the user acquisition stuff in order to scale. So I, I think we are pretty lucky in that, that the market is pretty competitive and it's competitive for publishers, but it's true opportunity for developers to see, okay, today I want to do hyper casual arcade game. I will have thousands of uh, really, really good Publishers that will help me a lot about developing my product, my user acquisition part, in order to review my process of working. So it will be a truly good occasion in order to learn tons of stuff. It will be super helpful. So I think definitely if you want to jump from developer to all the full part with the publisher side and on the UA, on the monetization as well, on my side, I will, I will not be able to do the monetization job as my monetization team do right now because it's super granular, super complex. And uh, definitely it's it's a true job and you can't do that like, like the really publishing experts are currently doing right now. So really thank you, Chance. Go go speak with the, all the different publishers that are on the market and they are all specialized in one specific stuff. So I'm pretty sure you will find the, the, the right key in order to develop your business. Nice. Maybe you can go back to making creative yourself as <laughs> well. Like you yeah, it's definitely not my objective for now, but uh, I, I'm still keep on UA, maybe a bit of monetization, but uh, that's it. <laughs> nice. Okay, uh, I think I got one last question for you. Uh, it's a pretty broad one. Uh, so what's next for Green Panda Games? Yeah, so uh, I think th this this year it's it's a bit of crazy because of, of iOS, because of all the different projects as well in, in, internally. So we are in really good period of growth and learning. We, we reach uh, the casual market on idle and we're still developing some really exciting uh, hyper casual idle games. And uh, we are on huge project uh, with external and internal developers in order to do some new hyper casual and casual idle game this year. So on my side, I'm truly really excited to, to play to the game as well. And um, yep, we, we continue to grow. So we are always looking for, for new people, new talented people to join us as a producer, GD, uh, developers. So don't hesitate to check our website in order to see if you, if you want to join the adventure and our journey. And uh, we'll be glad to, to see you in, in the near future. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your answers. I think we can... Uh move on to the Q&A session maybe, Michael? Yep, that sounds perfect. Thank you both. Uh, we got some, some great questions while you guys were talking. Uh, really enjoyed that conversation. So jumping into the QA, uh, first question for you, Pierre. Um, yeah. So we got a question around creatives and, and how things are structured at Green Panda. Um, so they wanted to know, you know, do you do things in-house? And if you had any tips or um, advice for someone who might be considering to do things in-house versus external uh, contract work to, to get creatives developed. Yeah, so since the beginning, we are doing all our creative internally. So I don't have any experience to say about external stuff, but uh, definitely it's, it's the true strength to have your all your creative team internally in order to, to have, as, as we said before, quick feedbacks. 
quick, you can jump really easily on the creative in order to say, okay, I, I think you are on the right way, but if you iterate just a bit on this point, I, I think it will be definitely better. So on, on my side, it's a, yeah, it's a true good point in order to have your internal team. And after that, regarding the organization, yeah, I think the, the most important part is about the communication, share your knowledge that you have on US side in order to feed your art team in order to understand as good as possible the UA market with all the different guidelines and possibilities, all the different tricks that you need to add about make the creative dynamic be on 15 seconds, on 30 second format as well. Try to do all the different format as well about the square, the portrait, the landscape. Be sure that you try everything on your side and uh, yet yeah, always iterate. Once you have one creative that seems to work correctly, don't don't hesitate to to do crazy stuff. Modify the color, the light. Try to add new scenarios. Just little tweak, and after that huge one, I think the, the best opportunity that you have is that you can try whatever you want on your product, and it's definitely the most important part. Was it was it obvious for you to to actually inter, uh, internalize the creation of playable ads because it's it requires quite some unique skills, right? So I know sometimes it's being outsourced. So in your case, how did you like make that decision? Yeah, uh, at the really beginning, I, I think only only a few months, we we tried to we we work with external team in order to do the playables, and really quickly we succeed to to create those team that is to definitely amazing because they have some skills. I, I think to yeah to two years ago it was not that obvious on the market in order to have those kind of team, and uh, yeah, it's making a true difference in order to have those guys in, in the team. On all the different game now, we see that the label has a, a true impact about the U, UA performance, whatever whatever the ad networks. So yeah, definitely a good point to as well to link both team in order to do the best best practice on the video and playable team as well in order to be synchronized and say yeah okay guys you have the best practice you are on the right way and uh, don't hesitate to propose your ID because you know that. Uh, We'll definitely test it in order to see if it's great or not. Great, that sounds good. Uh, we have another question for you, Pierre, around differences between uh, idle games and hyper casual. So, uh, someone from the audience is wondering, you know, how does the CPI and retention between these two genres, idle and hyper casual, uh, what do the differences look like? Yeah, good point. So. What we can say is that most of the time, if you are looking for hyper casual idle games, the CPI will, will look pretty much the same, will be a bit a bit higher. But in general, if you have really, really, really great hyper casual idle game, most of the time it will be exactly the same CPI as a hyper casual arcade game. So it could be really low if you are thinking about CPI on Facebook, for example, if you are testing on Facebook, it could be reached 10 cents, 20 cents pretty easily. And uh, if you are a good project, yeah, definitely you can reach a 10 cents. And after that, regarding the retention, I think we are higher even on early prototype regarding the retention. If you have a great prototype, you can easily reach 55, 60% D1 of retention. And after that, the key will be on, on the long term. On D7, D30, you need to be able to reach some decent amount of, uh, yeah, decent retention D7, D30 as well. Obviously, a prototype, if you have good results at D7, it's amazing. And we will never ask for different TA numbers. But yeah, if you are at 55, 60% D1, and you are able to reach 15 or 20% at D7, you are definitely on the on the right way. Do you also like see a trend, maybe internally at least, that you, you want to move more to in-app purchases base games, or you want to keep that 80-20, uh, let's say, split? Yeah, it's it's a true challenge about the, the balancing that we want to make. So on hyper casual, I think it's a it's obvious that we will never be able to reach more because the game is not adapted. But definitely on the on the casual part, we definitely want to add more yeah, subscription in app uh, in app purchases because the game will fit more with with this type of methodology of uh, yeah, monetization. So it's definitely uh, one of our objectives as well. So, so we got another question um, around, um, looks like a combination of prototyping and, and automation. So 
someone asked, uh, you know, I'm a developer and I spend quite a time, a lot of time optimizing uh, campaigns manually. Wondering how moving to automation can make this process of launching uh, games easier. Um, yeah. So I think that would be a, yeah, good go for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think on the really beginning of your testing, it's quite difficult to win sometimes because you, on our side at least, it needs to be simple because we establish a benchmark of all the different games and and now yeah, thousands of tests that we that we made, so we have our benchmark, we have our threshold about KPIs, our threshold about the quality of creative that we want to have, and. The objective is definitely don't don't lose your time on one prototype that does not seem to be really promising. So you will lose more time to optimize this not that promising one in order to maybe put two or three weeks in another prototype that could be much more successful in terms of marketability. So definitely at the really beginning, it's quite difficult to win some time regarding the automation. But after that, if you want to scale and develop your activity, I think you you will win definitely hours and hours of work because you will have the ability to to automize your your yeah definitely your campaign and uh, in comparison to do quick comparison i will never be able to do the the ras optimization that the machine and the algorithm can do because they will do thousands of optimization in few seconds and on my time on my side i will do maybe hundreds of optimization in several hours. So it could be definitely painful for me, a nightmare during my day, and it will definitely not force it in comparison of the RAS, RAS optimization with thanks to the automation. Makes sense. Uh, Cyril, I have a question for you that's come in. Um, since you work with a lot of different uh, developers, you know, across the board in different genres, what advice would you give to um, to a, a developer and advertisers who's looking to scale their, their gaming business? Um, that's a good one. Uh, I think what's very important is to have a, a stack, a, a product stack that allows you to be flexible, like Pierre said before. So try to automate as much as you can so you can focus on building games, which, are, which is like the one true mission of uh, game developers, right? So try to find solutions that allow to, to automate the uh, and monetization side. So in a bidding is like perfect for that. Then on the other side, um, uh, optimize campaigns, like moving away from CPI as soon as possible, not only because it's more tedious, but also because it doesn't drive as much growth and uh, you can't control as well your uh, profitability. Uh, try to automate as much as you can. You can also try to automate your creative process. Uh, I know there are some, some pretty uh, crazy setups at some uh, publishers who, who found ways to actually um, just build constantly creatives uh, with different concepts, small iterations and so on. So yeah, I think it's, it's all about the stack you will have on the product side of things that allows you to focus on the right things to do. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I think this one might be uh, for, for, for you, Pierre. Um, they're wondering, the, the question is about uh, choosing the right channel for your campaigns. And I think they're talking about different user acquisition channels. Um, are there difference among them? And, and how do you decide where to invest your time uh, as, a, as an advertiser? I think is a question for you, Pierre. Yeah. So um, I, I think regarding the, the right ad network, I, I think so as we as we say before, you need to test everything in order to be sure that which one will be the best. And regarding that, the KPIs that you need to looking for, I think as we say before, the RAS is pretty important. If you take into consideration the virality and the organic, you can take the, the ROI as well. And really important to say when you are profitable, when you are not, and in function of that, and in function as well of potential of scale that you could have on the game and on the different ad network. Obviously, you need to focus your time on the activity that will be the most profitable for you and your game. And it's pretty important to say that it will maybe work on one ad network for one game and for the other one, it will be on another one because they will have the traffic and, and the sources that will fit with your game. 
So it's definitely important to test everyone and not say, okay, it's working pretty well for the first one. I will only keep this ad network and forever and ever. And unfortunately, you will lose massive traffic and massive opportunities on the other one. So definitely be curious. Don't, don't hesitate to try all the different top performers on the platform and try all the stuff that could be maybe more smaller and maybe not that uh, not not that bright as Apple in some time, but uh, could be definitely great uh, for you guys. But yeah, I think we definitely need to be curious in order to trade. Awesome. Awesome. Did we just... <laughs> I think Michael's gone. Uh, just to add to that, actually, uh, I think I also think it's pretty important to basically yeah have have the right uh, approach to that. Um, oh, sorry, I think there's a technical technical glitch. Let me just check. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just just going uh, moving back to to the question. Um, I think what's pretty important is to to basically f um, work with the, let's say the usual suspects of all the, the like let's say three four big social networks, right? And then also uh, work with the top video networks uh, that you have on the side, and uh, and you can also kind of automate that process when you when you um, test your your games, right? So you will start maybe with social networks and then open expand to video networks that will be able to give you more volume and also like quality, obviously. So um, work with that, those, let's say five to 10 networks. And then after uh, always keep an eye out for uh, newcomers, like you said, it's, it's super important to, to test uh, networks every now and then, new networks. And also in some cases, some local networks can be pretty pretty relevant as well. So uh, for example, if you're buying in, in Asia, uh, in APAC, maybe you will be able to, to find some good ones for uh, Japan, for Korea and so on. So I think it's, it's pretty important to have, um, to have those as well. Uh, yeah, def also definitely. And, and maybe on, on both side, on, on US side and monetization side as well, don't, don't hesitate to try some local one. I think especially on, on market as like APAC or, or Russia, it's definitely important to try some local stuff in order to have greater prices. And uh, definitely on the US side, keep in mind that it's really important to say that if one creative is super well performing on one ad network, it's not potentially the case on the other one. So always be yeah, cautious and try to try step by step in order to see that if you have your confirmation on all the different network or it's not uh, just a lucky case on, on one. Awesome, awesome. Um, I think that's it on the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Pia. It was a real, real pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you, Cyril. It was super cool to talk with you today. Awesome. And uh, look, uh, really uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, Green Panda will be cooking for, uh, for the next year. <laughs> Definitely. Can't wait to be at the end of the year to, to show the different projects that we have uh, in stock. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.